when we think of searching, we think of a deliberate act. I lost my keys. I'm looking for my keys. Um, and it almost always is. But you can think of searching in a more general sense of any process that might come up with something, any process that might bump into something new that, that it could make use of. And if you think of searching in that more general sense, then it turns out that evolution really is a search problem. It's these species that are moving around. They're not trying to find anything, but as they move around through genetic mutations, they're, they're, they're wandering through a genetic space, and lo and behold, occasionally they bump into something that's new and useful. At least if evolution is gonna work, it has to work that way. These species moving around aimlessly that just happen to bump into uh, the DNA sequence that gives them a new function. So that's why you can view evolution as a search problem. That's, and that's one of the ways that I describe it in the book. So once you see that evolution really is a search problem, not an intentional deliberate search problem, but an accidental aimless search problem, the question is how small are the targets? How small are the treasures that a wandering species is hoping to find, is hoping to stumble upon. Not that it's hoping, but if evolution is going to work, it has to find these things. How small are the things that have to be found aimlessly? Uh, once, you, um, once you put the question in those terms, you can actually go and rigorously determine how small these targets are and how large the space is within which these species wander. And that allows you to say how likely or unlikely it is that aimless wandering is going to get you to that target. So it turns out you can quantify these things. Um, I've done it for the target of finding a new protein fold. So that's a new folded structure that gives a new function. Um, and you do it by um, randomizing little bits of this protein and seeing how tolerant the folded structure is to the randomized changes. And if you do this in various parts in the protein, you can actually come up with a reasonable figure for how small this little target is for getting all the amino acids right for a chain to collapse and form a functional fold. It turns out to be frighteningly improbable. Um, something like one in a trillion, 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 trillion sequences, possible sequences, have the right amino acid uh, uh, side chain properties to collapse and form a functional fold. Michael Denton proposed an upper limit on the number of tries for um, a biological species to stumble upon something new and interesting. And his upper limit was 10 to the 40th power. So that's one followed by 40 zeros. And he, he got that number by saying how many bacteria could possibly have existed in the history of life on Earth. Bacteria are much more abundant than any other organism. They're tiny, there's lots of them. 10 to the 40 ends up being an upper bound. There's no way that more than that number of organisms have existed. So he proposed this as the highest number of chances um, an accidental natural process could have to stumble upon something improbable. And that means if the improbable thing is less probable than 1 in 10 to the 40th, then it won't be stumbled upon in the history of life on Earth. Well, the probability I came up with for stumbling upon a single folded protein structure is 1 in 10 to the 74th, 1 followed by 74 zeros, which is very, very much less probable than Denton's limit, which means by his biological limit, there's no way that a new protein fold could be found by accident, by any accidental natural process.